My name is Rachel Tapman. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in linguistics. Uh, and my work focuses on three main sort of uh, areas. Uh, one is automatic speech recognition. One is language variation between social groups or sociolinguistics. Uh, and the third is speech perception, so how humans understand uh, language as it's being produced and how we do that in a fluent, easy way. And uh, this work really combines all three of these things together. So how can we use our knowledge of how humans understand speech from people of different groups to help ASR do the same thing? Um, and like I said, I'm going to be talking about speech today, but a lot of these same things apply to text. And if you're interested in that, we can, we can talk about it during the Q&A. So it may come as no surprise to many of you that automatic speech recognition does not always work so great with people who have different accents. Um, so this is a tweet from Lemon on Twitter. Um, and uh, the tweet says, dedicated to all my international friends who make fun of my accent. This is me asking Siri for directions to Wendy's burgers. And uh, what was recognized is, is it windy? And this is happening because this speaker is from New Zealand. Uh, and we're going to talk about this a couple times today. But New Zealand English has an ongoing change in their vowel system, where the vowel in e sounds more like e. So head would be hid. And also, this particular type of confusion between in and n is also something we find in the United States, uh, particularly in rural Southern California and in the South. So I am from the South, and in my home dialect, not my professional dialect, Wendy and Wendy are homophones for me, so they're words that sound the same. And this is a very common linguistic process, and it's a result of accents. And it's not just one person who's had a problem with this. Um, I did not have to look very hard to find a lot of people complaining about different systems on Twitter. Right? Uh, so the top tweet is from Craig. Uh, my dad's got that Amazon Echo, and all I can hear him shouting from downstairs is, excuse me, fuck off Alexa, because it's not understanding his accent. Um, Craig is Scottish. Don, I hate Siri. She doesn't understand me. S-M-A-F-H must be the accent. Uh, and also Google, Sam on Twitter. Mabulita is trying to talk to her Google home, and she's getting so pissed because it can't understand what she's saying because of her accent. So this is whatever the opposite of delight is as a user experience, right? People are so upset that they're going on Twitter and yelling about it. And again, I did not have to look too hard for these. These are all from the last couple of days. And it's not just individual anecdotal evidence as well. So this is um, some work that I've done on YouTube's automatic captions, which are driven by Google's speech engine, which is pretty much state of the art. Um, there's some contention, but it's up there. Um, and on the, um, this side, you can see uh, speakers from California and speakers from Georgia. And this accent is, this access is axis is word error rate. So zero would be everything correct all of the time. One would be everything wrong all of the time. And though there is individual variation, you can see that speakers from Georgia are getting more errors than speakers from California. And it's not just these two dialect groups, but I pick this one in particular because Georgia is in the South and the South is the largest demographic region in the United States, according to the US Census Bureau. So a plurality of people in the US live in the South. And if you're using a voice-based, um, an ASR-based virtual assistant, and you can't deal with Southern speech, you're going to have a problem reaching this market. So as a linguist and as someone who has a behavioral science background, uh, my answer to this question, to this problem is, well, we know that there's a system that can deal really, really, really well with different accents and can do it in a fast way and can do it in a robust way, and that is humans, right? I'm sure everyone in here has had the experience where you're talking to someone and they may be either speaking a language variety that you don't know or haven't encountered before, and it takes you a couple minutes and you're like, I don't get that, but then as you uh, interact with them more and more and you hear more and more, you get to the point where you can understand them easily or fluently, right? Um, and I think everyone has probably had that experience in their lives at one point or another. Um, and we've done, as linguists, a lot of laboratory studies on this, and this is a very 
strong process. Um, so it can happen after as few as two sentences that you can adapt to a new accent. And it also transfers from speaker to speaker. So if I meet someone from Edinburgh and I spend some time learning that sort of Edinburgh dialect, and then I meet somebody else from Edinburgh, I can take that sort of mental model that they have about what someone from Edinburgh sounds like and transfer it to the new speaker, right? So I, I, get, I get the benefit of having done this training earlier. So what are we doing to be so good at this? The answer is that we're not just using the acoustic signal. We're not just using um, the information that we're, we're hearing. We're also using other types of information, like our beliefs about the speaker. So um, one thing that we're relying on is gender. So based on your beliefs about somebody's gender, you will hear the same token as either SIP or SHIP. SIP or SHIP because the acoustic qualities of those fricatives vary between genders, right? Um, regional origin is another thing that can push around our beliefs. So Nancy Nijelski has a very famous study um, where she asked people to write down what they were hearing and they were hearing the same audio but at the top of each sheet was written either Detroit or Canada and their, uh, the, the writing just on the top of the sheet, just that one word, she didn't tell them anything about the speakers, pushed around people's perception. And it can be super subtle. Um, so one of my very favorite studies was done by Jen Hay and Katie Drager, uh, and they were looking at whether people would uh, report speeches being sounding more like it was from Australia or New Zealand. And to get people to sort of like think about these things, they had a stuffed animal in the room, and it was either a stuffed kangaroo or a stuffed kiwi, like the animal, the bird. And which animal was in the room changed people's speech perceptions, right? So we use a lot of world knowledge in day-to-day -day speech perception. This is a really robust thing. So what I want you to take away from this sort of discussion of the behavioral literature is that for a human listener, who's talking really matters. Your social identity is going to affect what I believe I'm hearing, even on like a very, very fine-grained phonetic level. So how can we have automatic speech recognition systems that do the same thing, that use sort of the social information? My answer to this is that we can explicitly include speakers' demographic information during training and recognition. Right. Um, and I'm going to just show you sort of like a, a smaller proof of concept. Um, and I'm using um, here some things that you might not use if you were doing this to implement it on a larger scale. But I'm doing this because it's very interpretable and you can really see what's going on. Um, and the reason that I'm using New Zealand English and US English is because of a confusion I mentioned earlier. So you don't really need to know all, all the details here. Uh, this is the first and second formant on the axes. And they're not backwards. The reason that they're this way is because this sort of shows the shape of the mouth. If you can imagine that I'm standing like this, this is the top and front of the mouth. This is the front and bottom of the mouth. As we move this way, we go back. As we go this way, we move up. And there's a very strong confusion between these tokens. So heed in US English and heed in New Zealand English are pretty much the same. That makes sense. E is a vowel, tends to be very stable between languages. Uh, the US hid sounds like the New Zealand English head. The US head sounds like the New Zealand English had. That's something like head. Sorry, that's something like head. Uh, and the US had is all the way down here at the bottom. And then the New Zealand English hid, because it's been sort of squeezed out as head was moving up, is being pushed down into the back. So it sounds something like hood, right? So maybe H-U-D, ah, which I guess depending on your background may or may not be a word for you. Ah. So in order to help learn these differences, I built a system. Um, and for both the training and the testing data, I'm using audio from speakers of New Zealand English and American English. And they're sociologically matched. So these are women who are educated, college educated, uh, white, and between the ages of 20 and 25. So I'm controlling for other factors. Uh, and for features, I'm using the first and second formants, which are the axes from this graph. But you could use kepstrels, you could use sort of whatever features you're using, um, states. Uh, and for the output, and I'm also including uh, speaker dialect. So are they from the US or are they from New Zealand? 
And for my classifier, I'm using conditional inference trees. So this is a type of decision tree that splits on statistical inference rather than information gain. And the benefit there is that it's not biased towards factors with more levels. So speaker dialect here has two levels. Uh, F2 has, you know, 1,400 levels. So if you're biased towards things with more levels, you're less likely to use dialect. Uh, and I'm using conditional inference trees because they're very interpretable, they're very transparent. You could use whatever machine model, machine learning model you liked, neural nets or whatever it was we were using that time. Um, and so the output looks something like this. Um, and we are splitting whoop, on the first formant predominantly, which makes sense because these, uh, these uh, uh, vowels are mainly uh, separated on this axis, if you remember from the graph. And here and here, we're spitting on speaker dialect. So what I want you to get from this is that this is not two separate recognition systems, right? The top node is not splitting on dialect. So what, you're, what this means is that you're using the learning that you've already done and the data that you already have, and you're not sort of like throwing it away and building a new model from scratch. You're just sort of augmenting an existing model. Uh, and then the outputs here are uh, probabilities over words, but again, you can do phones, you can do states, whatever it is that you're working on. So the key benefit of this system is that when I added speaker demographics, I improved recognition for the target dialect, and I didn't reduce recognition rates for my source dialect. Um, and a lot of systems that, that have done on this, uh, the system that ends up working best on, the, and this is just an example, the system that ends up working best on the target dialect, the one you're trying to adapt towards, also has a drop in accuracy for the source dialect, the one that you're sort of adapting from. Right? This doesn't. And I'm not just going to tell you that. Um, so for comparison, the top row here is the model trained only on data from American speakers. Um, and as you can see, it works really great on American speakers and does not work very well on New Zealand speakers. When I add New Zealand data to the mix, so I have US data and New Zealand data, um, I get a tiny, a tiny little reduction for the American speakers and a big boost for the New Zealand speakers, but it's still not great. Then, when I add demographic data, there is no change from just adding New Zealand data. So the American speakers, excuse me, have the same error rate, but we get a boost for the New Zealand speakers. So we're improving our accuracy, um, assuming that we're using both types of data for only the target dialect, um, while not changing it for the source dialect. So if you wanted to build a system like this, or incorporate this into an existing system, what would you need? You would need, first off, data tagged with speaker demographics. Um, and I, again, there's a lot of proprietary data out there, and I don't necessarily know what y'all have. Um, but there are a lot of sociolinguistic corpora available. Um, a lot of uh, sociolinguistic work um, is sort of in an interview setting as well, so people are just talking naturally. And if you're interested in those data sources, I can point you towards them. You also need to know which demographics matter, right? And this is a little bit of a harder question. I've had people ask me, well, what about speaker height? What about speaker religion? Are these things that are going to matter uh, in, a, in a speech recognition model? Uh, and fortunately, also religion and height, I think both are not going to matter in this, in this context. Um, this is a very active area of investigation, and we have a lot of work on it. So if you're interested in figuring out which demographics matter, I would recommend that you hire a sociolinguist and someone with a sociolinguistics background, because they can tell you what the research says is important. And not just in English, also in different languages in different uh, countries. And you also need to know something about talker demographics, right? Um, so that's a little bit more difficult. My solution is kind of a dumb one, and that's just to have people fill out a questionnaire um, to say what their demographics are explicitly. Um, and there's also work doing uh, on deducing it from metadata, like GPS. There's an IEEE paper last year on um, dialects of Chinese, which is a little bit of a, a harder problem because Chinese dialects are more divergent than English dialects. Uh, but it's very doable, um, and I think that if you include demographic information from your speakers, you will see a boost for your target dialects without uh, reducing accuracy for your source dialects. All right, thank you.